On December 25th, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev resigned as General Secretary of the Communist Party and as President of the Soviet Union. A half hour later, the red flag over the Kremlin, emblazoned with hammer and sickle, was lowered. The Soviet Union was no more. There had been no mass protests on the streets of Moscow, no military conflict with a foreign or domestic enemy. And yet, the unthinkable had just occurred. The individual republics comprising the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics had declared their independence. And one of history's largest empires disintegrated into the darkness of the winter evening. What had happened since Gorbachev came to power just six years earlier? Princeton University historian Stephen Kotkin offers us a clue. He says that Gorbachev tried to make the Communist Party both the instrument and the object of his reforms. And this proved untenable. Gorbachev was a devout communist believer, an idealistic reformer, who was among the most accidental revolutionaries in history. He'd wanted to reform communism in order to save it. And yet, he unintentionally dismantled the Soviet Union in the process. In many ways, Gorbachev's idealism was sandwiched between the authoritarian tendencies that both preceded and followed him. The neo-Stalinism of his most significant contemporary predecessor, Leonid Brezhnev, and the neo-Tsarist era of his most significant successor, Vladimir Putin. But to understand this, we need to go back in history to a time when Leonid Brezhnev pushed his one-time patron, Nikita Khrushchev, from power in a 1964 party coup. Leonid Brezhnev had been just a boy when Vladimir Lenin led the Bolshevik Revolution that initiated the Soviet period in 1917. Brezhnev became a full member of the Communist Party in his 20s, and for a time he worked as an engineer, until devoting himself to politics. His standing in party circles rose, thanks to the support of Khrushchev after Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. Brezhnev repaid Khrushchev by supporting his benefactor when the so-called anti-party group tried to push Khrushchev from office in 1957. But the next time, it would be Brezhnev who led the coup. The Brezhnev years in the Soviet Union from 1964 to 1982 are usually described as a period of stagnation, but it was one of the most stable eras in USSR history. More Soviet citizens than ever before enjoyed better access to household items like refrigerators, telephones, and televisions, and the number of people living in communal apartments dropped. The problem was, that Soviet citizens' expectations had also grown. Khrushchev had vowed that the Soviet Union would overtake the United States economically by 1970. But Brezhnev inherited a declining economy, and throughout his tenure, the growth rate trudged along at roughly 1% a year, a large military budget, and the high costs associated with maintaining Soviet hegemony in Eastern Europe put a damper on the aging revolution. At the same time, corruption and patronage benefited some actors in the state economy at the expense of others. And the black market flourished like never before. One growth area during the Brezhnev years, a period known as advanced socialism, was in alcohol consumption. People drank out of desperation, and alcoholism became a national scourge. The Soviet people didn't always know the details of their country's economic problems, but they felt them. You see, empty store shelves belied the positive assessments appearing in Soviet newspapers like Pravda, meaning truth, and Izviestia, translated as news. This gave rise to the Soviet joke that there was no truth in Pravda and no news in Izviestia. The vast majority of Soviet citizens weren't dissidents, but they weren't naive stooges of the com communist government either. And so one way that everyday Soviets gave voice to the absurdity of the situation was through jokes called anecdoti in the Russian language. Alexei Yurchak, a professor of anthropology at UC Berkeley, defines anecdoti as short formulaic jokes 
that constituted a popular genre of irony during the Brezhnev years. These witticisms poked fun at Soviet leaders, at the Soviet system, and at people's complicity in keeping socialism afloat. One joke refers to Brezhnev driving his elderly mother to Moscow for a visit. Looking around her son's ap luxurious apartment, filled with Persian rugs, imported vases, and antique furniture, she asked with alarm, what will happen to you if the communists come back? My favorite, though, is the one about a man on Moscow's Red Square shouting, Brezhnev is an idiot. Immediately, he is seized by security forces and sentenced to 15 years, five years for insulting the Soviet leader, and 10 years for betraying a state secret. The Soviets might laugh at their leaders, but they still found cause for pride in their nation, particularly every four years when the Olympic Games got underway. The Soviet state had always emphasized the importance of physical fitness for its people. During the Cold War, Olympian competitions between Western and Soviet bloc athletes achieved importance on par with state diplomacy. The Soviet hockey team suffered an unlikely setback at the hands of amateur American ice hockey players at the 1980 Winter Games in Lake Placid, New York. But once it did, the Soviets plotted their redemption at the 1980 Summer Games to be held in Moscow. Unfortunately for sports fans, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in late 1979 resulted in a, in a boycott of the Moscow Olympics by 66 countries, including the United States. The Soviets intervened to prop up a leftist regime in Afghanistan, and this dragged on for a decade at a cost of 15,000 Soviet lives and a tremendous amount of money. Brezhnev never saw fit to disengage. He and his fellow aging members of the Politburo ruled complacently, even as the economic growth rate fell to zero. William and Mary historian Stephen Hansen says, five decades after the Bolshevik revolution, the revolutionary dream of transforming the nature of modernity itself was increasingly giving way to complacency among the older generation, of which Brezhnev and the Politburo were a part. After all, the ruling elite continued to enrich themselves at the expense of the nation. Even Brezhnev's daughter, Galina, got in on the act, allegedly smuggling diamonds out of the country by hiding them in circus animals. It seems incredible, but this was the Soviet reality. The system had moved away from the Bolsheviks' utopian visions of the 1920s, and there seemed to be no prospects for change. Then, the leadership started to die. And unlike at other times in Soviet history, these deaths weren't nefarious. Instead, Soviet leaders were dying from old age. In the early 1980s, the deaths of high-ranking Soviet or party officials became commonplace including the 75-year-old Brezhnev himself. But instead of replacing the late Brezhnev with someone from a younger generation, the Politburo named the 70-year-old Yuri Andropov as the new general secretary. And he died 14 months later, in February 1984. Next up was the 74-year-old Konstantin Chernyanko, who lasted barely a year before expiring in March of 1985. Alexei Yurchak, the UC Berkeley historian with a well-developed sense of humor, relates a Soviet joke from the time that captures just how ridiculous the situation was becoming. It goes as follows. A man is approaching Red Square while the funeral of yet another Politburo member is underway. He's stopped by a state security officer who asks him if he has a pass to the great man's funeral. A pass, the Soviet citizen replies, I have a season ticket. It was after Chernenko's death that the party leadership named the 52-year-old Mikhail Gorbachev as the next general secretary of the Communist Party and leader of the country. Having come of age during the cultural thaw of the Khrushchev era in the 1950s and early 1960s, it's clear that th this experience had stayed with Gorbachev, and now, Mikhail initiated a platform of reform 
ostensibly, to save the revolution. Unfortunately for him, the high global oil prices of the 1970s that had allowed for a measure of economic stability in the Soviet Union had since gone bust. Furthermore, the USSR faced a stagnant economy, the ruinous war in Afghanistan, and a surge of military spending by the United States under its anti-communist president, Ronald Reagan. Seeing the necessity, Gorbachev initiated a restructuring of the Soviet centrally planned economy. Known as perestroika, it called for a more flexible system of economic management and opportunities for enterprises to become self-financing. However, for the new plan to succeed, Gorbachev believed that Soviet citizens also needed to be more informed. This initiated his policy of glasnost. Glasnost removed the rigid limitations of state censorship and allowed for unprecedented levels of freedom of expression. Gorbachev hoped that glasnost would rejuvenate the Soviet people. Instead, it exposed systemic social and political problems. And these irrevocably tarnished many of the legitimizing myths of the Soviet system. On the television nightly news, Soviets began to see social upheavals once hidden from sight. One exception was the horrific accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in northern Ukraine in April 1986. The Gorbachev government issued no statement on the accident for days, instead clinging to decades-old habits of maintaining silence in the face of domestic disasters. As the Chernobyl ash swept across Northern Europe, radiation detectors in Sweden measured pronounced levels of radioactivity. Only then did the Soviet government begin to tell the people and the world the truth. Dozens of people were dead and tens of thousands more had been exposed to disastrous levels of radiation. This turned into a public relations nightmare for the Gorbachev regime. And by the time the Soviet leader delivered a television address about the disaster three weeks later, he'd squandered much of his credibility. Public confidence was undermined. Other forces also conspired against the new Soviet leader, including some that he had unleashed. Underground books and music reflecting the thoughts of the Soviet Union's gifted dissidents now had official press runs and pressings and they lined store shelves. In turn, the economic restructuring, perestroika, necessitated new sources of state funding. Gorbachev decided that the most expedient source of savings was in military expenditures. So he worked to find a way out of Afghanistan, to reduce the arms race with the Americans, and to extricate the Soviets from their commitments in Eastern Europe. In a 1988 speech before the United Nations General Assembly in New York City, Gorbachev renounced the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine. Under the Brezhnev Doctrine, the Soviet Union had reserved the right to intervene in any state where socialism was in jeopardy. It had first been used to crush the Prague Spring of Czechoslovakia in 1968. But now, Gorbachev rejected the very framework that had helped maintain Soviet hegemony in Eastern Europe since the end of World War II and throughout the Cold War. He also announced that the USSR would reduce the forces in Eastern Europe by 500,000 over the next two years. This proved decisive. Without Moscow's military support, the communist regimes of Eastern Europe fell in quick succession. And in the Soviet Union, Protesters filled Red Square on May Day, 1990, with jeers, boos, and calls to resign as Gorbachev and his fellow leaders stood by glumly. Meanwhile, Gorbachev had also created a new legislature called the Congress of People's Deputies that had introduced contested elections and a new crop of politicians on the national stage. These included the former de facto mayor of Moscow, Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin had suffered mixed political fortunes under Gorbachev, 
including a significant demotion in the Communist Party in 1988 and allegations of public drunkenness the following year. But he was elected to the Congress of People's Deputies in March 1989. And now he led a radical reform faction. Gorbachev's position worsened after he supported an initiative to end the Communist Party's monopoly on power in February 1990. This was an attempt to gain control of the reforming tide that was surging past him. A month later, he was elected to the newly created position of president of the Soviet Union and appeared to have weathered the storm. But appearances were deceiving. The Baltic republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia soon asserted their national sovereignty, a threat more severe and immediate than the dissolution of the Eastern Bloc had been. And Boris Yeltsin brilliantly used nationalist sentiment to stake a claim to authority ap apart from Gorbachev. His popular rhetoric gave the Soviets an alternative in which to believe. As additional republics began to pull away from Moscow's control, Gorbachev tried to salvage the Union by accommodating popular sentiment he increasingly liberalized his policies to stave off threats both from hardline communists and nationalists like Yeltsin. But in May 1990, two months after Gorbachev had been named president of the Soviet Union, Yeltsin was elected president of the Russian Republic, the state's largest political entity. And if the two men had ever been allies, they weren't any longer. Yeltsin cleverly championed the primacy of the Russian Republic over the authority of the Soviet Union. Once he did, other republics followed suit. Gorbachev was under pressure from other factions as well. Communist hardliners placed him under house arrest in August 1991 and transferred power to the vice president. But the plotters had failed to arrest Yeltsin and as news spread that Gorbachev was being held, Yeltsin made his way to the White House, the building that housed the Russian parliament, to organize a popular defense against the coup. Images of Yeltsin standing on top of a tank and rallying support for popular visions of democracy were beamed throughout the country and around the world. Within three days, the putsch had failed. The counter-revolution was over. In the immediate aftermath, the Soviet Congress of People's Deputies was disbanded, as was the Communist Party, and individual Soviet republics declared their independence from the USSR, one after the other. So there was no longer any Soviet Union left for Gorbachev to lead. On December 25, 1991, he resigned. The era of the USSR had come to an end when the Soviet flag was lowered for the last time from the top of the Kremlin, and the tricolor flag of the Russian Federation was raised in its place. No jubilant crowd stood shouting hurrah, however. No statues were ripped from their bases. No figure was burned in effigy. And no group of revolutionaries embraced the seemingly impossible as having been accomplished. Instead, Newspaper reports described a sense of uncertainty as a small group of onlookers watched this historic moment unfold. Some felt more than a little regret. One young woman told a reporter for the New York Times, I'm sorry for the Soviet Union. I'm sad. I'm sorry a great country is falling apart before my eyes. As we now know, the transition from communism and the culture of a one-party state to capitalism and democracy would be exponentially more difficult than exchanging one flag for another. Communist apparatchiks didn't suddenly become liberal Democrats. They had a vested interest in maintaining their prerogatives of power and influence. Many had exploited the system and even pilfered from the state for years. Decades of economic atrophy, corruption, bribery, secrecy, and privilege access also lingered. So when communism in the Soviet state fell, many former elites 
became the new oligarchs. They built their fortunes on the ruins of the Soviet economy and then used their wealth to obtain political power, according to expatriate journalist Masha Gessen. More troubles lay ahead. Boris Yeltsin's demeanor as a man of the people who rode a bus to work soon seemed a charade. His virtue receded behind a drunken haze in both private and public, and he fell prey to cronyism, corruption, and his own thirst for power. Once a defender of Russian democracy, having stood atop that tank before the White House two years earlier, in 1993, Yeltsin directed tanks to fire on the Russian parliament. In doing so, he set the stage for a new round of authoritarian rule that would rival that of the Romanov czars and Soviet commissars. Russian parliamentarians drafted constitutional amendments that would limit Yeltsin's power, but he used force to maintain control. He also expressed a communist leader's typical unfamiliarity with capitalism. Although Yeltsin embraced economic reforms as a sort of shock therapy to transition to a market economy, these led to horrible inflation and privations for the people. About the only Russians who saw their material fortunes improve as the 1990s progressed were the new oligarchs. Yeltsin and his allies gave away Soviet state companies at bargain prices to former communist era insiders. The price? Their political loyalty. Yeltsin's health deteriorated as the decade wore on, and his approval ratings fell to less than 10% by the end of the decade. Still, with the rampant corruption he oversaw, those in ruling circles had an incentive to make sure that the next Russian president wouldn't throw the lot of them in jail. So, in the late summer of 1999, they plucked from obscurity a former KGB official, Vladimir Putin, who appears to have been the choice of several oligarchs closely connected to Yeltsin. A few months later, Yeltsin himself resigned in a surprising New Year's Eve address to the nation, and Putin became president. In turn, Putin made himself into the non-Yeltsin. He used separatist violence that rattled the Caucasus as an excuse to increase a broader regional tendency towards authoritarian rule. For instance, a series of apartment bombings in 1999 when he was still Yeltsin's prime minister allowed Putin to employ strong-arm tactics and renew the bombing of the Chechen capital of Grozny. After becoming president, he took an increasingly tough stance on the war in Chechnya. His demeanor as a tough, no-nonsense ruler who promised stability and safety to a country buffeted by a decade of turbulence and declining, declining global prestige appealed to the population. Meanwhile, as the economy recovered from its 1998 nadir, Putin's popularity grew. In the years to come, he would engineer a level of popularity rivaling the personality cult of Joseph Stalin. He did so by presenting himself as the personification of Russian strength and power. He reached into Russia's past to resurrect the ghosts of an earlier era, real or imagined, of stability, security, power, and prestige. And he promised to return Russia to the summit. More broadly, Concepts of Russian nationality and defensiveness reemerged on levels not seen since the reigns of Tsars Alexander III and Nicholas II in the late 1800s and early 1900s. These coalesced in Russia's 21st century annexation of Crimea and its meddling in Ukraine. In his own defense, Putin argues that the West throughout history is constantly trying to sweep Russia into a corner. Putin has gone so far as to revive the idea of a Russian nation that's not coterminous with existing political borders. That's to say, he seems to believe that Russia and its leaders have a blank check on which to draw to defend the interests of Russians, even beyond its territorial borders.
Putin also revived the Russian practices and principles of strong authoritarian leadership, a dynamic foreign policy, and a celebration of traditional Russian ideals in a manner strikingly reminiscent of past rulers like Ivan the Terrible during the 16th century, Catherine the Great in the 18th century, and of course, Joseph Stalin. Putin also propelled a revival of the Russian Orthodox Church, including its precepts of faith, loyalty to the hierarchy, and national identity, and an appreciation for Russia's historical past extending beyond the Bolshevik Revolution. These cultural currents facilitated the rebuilding of great historical structures like the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, and an appreciation for great literary figures, including Alexander Pushkin and Leo Tolstoy. But Putin also inspired the persecution of groups who didn't conform to state-prescribed ideals. This includes the harassment, sometimes deadly, of journalists who challenged his status quo. The political and cultural renaissance of Russia under Putin also led to renewed popular fondness for larger-than-life leaders like Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, and Stalin again. As you can see, the Romanov czars may be long dead and buried. The Soviet Union may be gone for good. But beliefs rooted in Russia's long history and its rich culture, these endure. <laughs>